Okay, first of all, in order to be able to uh, consider the market in, in the Middle East and, and try to study it, the first thing is trying to do the research, and the research is really hard. Uh, data is not available, okay? So just to have an estimation, we try to get the data from smartphone penetration. And if there are smartphones, then there are games, definitely, okay? Penetration is uh, higher in the Gulf region, with Qatar, for example, with 75%, while, um, while Saudi Arabia, for example, is 60%, is, uh, and uh, Egypt is only 26% smartphone penetration, okay? Uh, most of the smartphone users are males with 62%, but in, in general, uh, I've, I've researched more to check what categories the, the people who own smartphones would, would uh, search for. And mainly, the, the almost 50% of the, uh, those who own an iPhone would search for games, whether searching for games directly or searching for entertainment or uh, other categories. And uh, almost 43% of those uh, owning uh, an Android would search for games. Okay, and I'd advise you if you want to go check more about the business to check newzoo.com. It's having lots of figures. Uh, that they offer lots of figures publicly, and okay, and lots of them, of course, uh, are, are paid services. Anyway, so that's that's about the numbers. Let's. Uh, Let's see again the, the, the top 10 countries by revenue. And uh, I'm, I'm comparing the top 10 worldwide versus those in the MENA region. Okay. Uh, okay. I, again, I guess uh, most of the numbers are, are really small for you to, re to read. But the world, world leader is China with $22 billion in revenue followed by the U.S. with 21 billion. But in our region, Turkey is the leader with uh, 400 plus million dollars. Uh, and Egypt uh, ranks uh, fourth in, uh, in the region. Anyways, I'd, I'd say uh, let's enough with the numbers. Let's go talk about the games themselves. So about streaming creativity. Uh, and how the whole thing started uh, years back. So, as, as Stephanie was saying, uh, the, for me, the passion started when I was 10 years old. I had a Sinclair computer, a very old uh, machine. Uh, and then, using this computer, I was able to develop my first game, which was Monopoly, when I was 10 years old. Okay. Uh, and from then, the passion started, and for me, that was my career that I wanted, and I wanted nothing else. That's why later in 1997, I joined the AUC uh, as a computer science student, because all I wanted at the time was to study uh, game development. Unfortunately, I was a little disappointed because game development uh, as a program was not offered at AUC. I only learned about programming, but I had to later do self-studies in, uh, in so many fields related to games. I even took courses in 3D graphics. Not that I'm an artist, but I just wanted to know what, what's going on in the business. Uh, I studied the industry itself, and it all started actually with uh, some books I ordered from Amazon. So I got the books, and from there on, I kept reading and studying and knowing what's going on and testing and everything. Till I got an idea about the business itself. Uh, in by 2005, uh, there was something. I don't think it's it's available anymore. That, that was called Yahoo Groups. So it's a mailing group, emails, where people would uh, put their emails in for job offers for lots of things like that. And there was a group about uh, computer science students in Egypt, and I decided, okay, I'll send them that I want people to join for free, so we develop games. And to my surprise, tens of people answered back, and many of them was interested, 
I've met people from Ilmenia, people from Banha, people from Alexandria, and we started projects together. All of us, like, we, we learned together, we did everything together. So it was an amazing experience uh, for, for all of us. Then in 2007, I decided to start my own company, Streaming Creativity. And at the time, I had only one project in mind that's driving in Egypt, and I'm going to talk to about it a few minutes uh, later. Uh, unfortunately, that project didn't see the light uh, due to funding reasons, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that. In 2010, I noticed that uh, I'm paying a lot of money for salaries, for rent, for everything, and I'm not getting any revenue back. So I decided that uh, it's, uh, it's time that I shift my, uh, my attention to smaller games, to marketing games. Uh, I approached many companies and uh, I developed games for them uh, for, for marketing purposes. Uh, and as well, I decided to uh, develop for mobile games. At first, Driving Care was aimed at PC. Then I decided I'll go for more for mobile games. In uh, 2011, I, uh, I had the honors to attend a conference in the States, a gaming conference in the States. Uh, and I had a paper published in the conference itself uh, about the techniques we've used in driving in Cairo. And it was a great chance for me that I've met so many gaming en enthusiasts all around the world. So uh, I've learned from them, especially that most of them were academic. And I've never met an academic in, in this field uh, before. So for me, that, that was a great uh, conference to attend. And actually, uh, we became friends, and uh, many of them, be one of them actually became a client of mine later. Uh, the next year, I, I published my first game on the App Store. Uh, it was called Bugminator. Uh, but you won't be able to find the game now. Uh, the game actually failed because I totally ignored the marketing side of it. So I was totally focusing on the game, but I totally ignored the marketing and it didn't work. Uh, then uh, we, ha we launched the game called Cerberus with the client I met in the conference the year before. I'm going to talk about service later. The game got awards uh, from uh, ESA, the uh, European Space Agency. Last year was a great year for me. I started another project called the Archipels. And the Archipels uh, is a game on mobile devices. And uh, actually, the game started in January 2014. And the game was, I. I, I pressed the submit button to the App Store last Monday. So I, it's been a, a long time, two years developing the game, just ab about to be released. Um, I'm waiting for the uh, Apple approval, but the game, and I hope you'd enjoy it once it's, uh, it's time. So quickly talking about the projects um, that I've, uh, I've developed. And uh, starting by Cerberus, which is a very dear project to me. Okay, Cerberus, if, if the name itself comes from Greek mythology, it means the three-headed hound that uh, used to guard uh, uh, the gates to the underworld. Okay, and three-headed hound because our game is about searching. Okay, uh, the game is done for a Dutch client. Uh, incubated by ESA, by the European Space Agency, and Blackshore, which is the company in the uh, Netherlands, streaming creativity, and together we had uh, servers. And actually it's version two. Version one was experimental. So, talking about servers, first aspect of it is crowdsourcing, okay? And I want you to imagine, okay, if I give you Google Earth, Okay, you can zoom to any level you want. And I ask one of you to look for dinosaur bones in the Western desert. Okay, how would you do that? For, I guess for, for anyone, this would take hundreds of years, right? Like searching the, the, the desert, all of it by himself, right? What if I tell you all to, to do that together? So you're going to split it into small parts and, and search in there. What if I tell 100,000 or a million people worldwide to do that? So having a very high resolution map and a lots of people working on it, then uh, the results would come 
much quicker. That's actually the problem we have with data. We have satellite, uh, satellites around Mars getting us very high resolution maps, but then not enough scientists to filter the data. Okay? So Cerberus idea is to have it as a game. Let's give the people very high resolution maps. Okay? Let them look for what we want. So instead of the scientists doing the, the job of filtering every pixel of the map, let millions of players do it, okay, and we'll have the data in no time. So that's the first part of Cerberus. And while doing so, we're going to offer you e-learning. So if we're talking about dinosaurs in the western deserts, so while you're doing that, you're going to have help telling you about dinosaurs, their lives, everything about them. Again, that's what we do with Cerberus in every pro project that we do. We tell the people of the cause we're looking for, what the scientists are looking for, so we get them more excited about the project itself. The last part is the outreach. So because of the e-learning aspect and because people are uh, getting really interested to know and learn, they tell their friends, we reach a lot of people with the knowledge and uh, asking them for, for help in our projects. So uh, our outreach is, is large. Okay. So before we go any further, can you imagine the possibilities? Can you imagine what we can do with, with this platform? Like the possibilities are endless. Actually, we've, uh, we've had two projects that I really, really uh, feel the cause was great using Cerberus. The first one of them was uh, Typhoon Haiyan that was in the Philippines in 2013. Villages were destroyed. Lots of people died in, uh, during that time. And uh, Cerberus wa was able to help with a little part. We got maps of the areas damaged. And because the UN and many other agencies had people working uh, on ground, but these people weren't able to reach uh, those they want to rescue because of the damaged roads, because of flooding and everything. So we let the people do the work. So we asked the people to map the roads, to tell us which roads are destroyed, which, uh, which roads are flooded. And they were able to get us with lots of data that we sent to on-ground groups, helping them to go faster. Uh, yeah. And uh, the next project is the most important, actually. And that was during the Yazidi crisis in, uh, in Iraq uh, the last year. And the Yazidis uh, fled their homes and went to a place called Mount Sinjar, where they were trapped by ISIS. Uh, so our part was that uh, we were able to uh, send our satellites over there, take images, and know where their camps are. We knew where the refugees are. And we sent the data to the UN, to the Catholic Relief Services, to the Red Cross. We had our contacts here and in the Netherlands and in Iraq, actually. So we tried to frame a, whole, a full framework to help uh, the Yazidis in their uh, crisis back then. And uh, because of the abilities of Cerberus, of mapping Mars and mapping Earth and doing uh, lots of helpful things uh, to science, we had two awards uh, back in 2012. Uh, the awards were offered by uh, the European Space Agency at the GMES uh, Awards. <laughs> the next game I'm going to talk about is the game I started uh, the company for. It's Driving in Cairo. And I guess there is no need to talk about Driving in Cairo. I guess all of you know how the driving goes, how crazy it is. Okay? So my game was mainly focused on that. My game was about the driving habits, uh, about the beauty of Cairo and the craziness of the driving uh, at, at the same time. Uh, the game was supposed to be a GTA-style game. So uh, it's a game where you drive a car, you do missions, you get out of the car, talk to people in the street. And actually, until 2011, where we stopped the project, uh, the game was like that. Okay? There was even harassment. Like you'd go in the street, go to a girl, and then there was harassment and people would gather. There was lots of things um, going there. Uh, the game had, uh, the, the graphics was, the, our demo was in uh, Tahrir Square, okay? And uh, the buildings were replicas of their originals in, uh, in, 
the square, actually. Uh, the names were different. And actually, on, on the side, you can see, for example, that this is Dr. Rami Wasif, for example. It's like we were having fun at the time. Okay. Uh, there is day-to-day -day life. Um, people crossing the street uh, all of a sudden. And I had a huge problem with that. So every book, every paper I'd read about artificial intelligence would tell you how to make the car go in its lane. And then all of a sudden, what I have to do is not make the car go in its lane. How to make the people suddenly cross the street. So that was a huge challenge for me. Uh, but it was real fun. Uh, that's an overview, for example, of, uh, of Tahrir Square. Uh, monumental buildings like Mugamma uh, Tahrir. Okay? And actually, if, if you'd go any day, you'd appreciate the beauty of each building in the square. We really did uh, the beauty, the authenticity of, of the buildings, and we tried to replicate everything uh, in there. And the last game I'm talking about is the Archipels, the project we started uh, a year ago. And this project is really interesting in that I knew from the beginning that I'll need a lot of funds for it. Uh, and actually, I was uh, able to approach my family and friends and collect the funds that I needed. Uh, we were able to raise a huge sum of money. And from that sum of money, we started the project and was able to endure till till last week. Uh, the game idea itself started when I was eight years old, playing with my cousin. We developed the game on paper, with a paper and pen. And then the idea stuck uh, on my head for years and years, until I was able actually to, to develop the idea itself. So here are some uh, screenshots, and you're the first people to see the screenshots from the, uh, from the game. Uh, so at first, it's Clash of Clans style. So you're going to build your base. You're going to build uh, buildings and then raise some units. Then you're going to train your units. You're going to have a campaign with uh, several levels. And then you're going to have a battle. And here's a quick video uh, of, of how the battle itself would go. It's not working. OK. The video is not working, no problem. So it's all about flicking. So you'd put your hand on any of the units. You just flick it, and the unit moves. If the unit moves far enough, it might attack any other uh, enemy unit. So it's all about strategy. At the same time, you have to gain a skill of flicking your units and trying to, to outflank your, your enemy. Okay. This is the last slide in my presentation. and. Uh, OK, I need to check the time first. Four more minutes. OK, perfect. So uh, I don't have any more slides, actually, except for the thank you at the end. And I'm, I'm just going to talk to you about the important lessons I've learned, uh, or, or if any of you is a gaming enthusiast who wants to develop a game, uh, some lessons that uh, I'd, I'd love to, to tell you. First of all, the indie games. So uh, indie games is a really important thing these days. Okay? Indie games are game studios that publish their games by themselves. They don't need a publisher to publish their own games. Okay? Uh, this is becoming a real thing uh, in, in the past few years. And we can think about a game, for example, like Minecraft. Minecraft started in 2009 by a Swedish developer. And then in 2009, it was just a beta version or alpha version, actually. In 2011, he released the uh, real, the actual version of the game. In 2014, Microsoft bought Minecraft for $2.5 billion. Okay? So an indie game, a small company, with no funds, was able to reach $2.5 billion. Okay? That's a huge example. But OK, you might think that uh, Minecraft is a huge game. Okay? Let's think about a much smaller game, a game that was released on uh, iPhones and, and Androids, actually. Uh, it's called Flappy Bird. 
Did any, any of you hear, hear about it? Okay. So, Flappy Bird, uh, a developer from, from Vietnam, decided that uh, he'll... Yes. <laughs> so, he, he developed a very simple game, yet a very hard game, extremely hard game. And within days, the game was a hit to the extent that it was the most uh, downloaded uh, game on, on uh, the, the uh, App Store, okay? And uh, by the end, the, the developer decided that he'll pull the game out of the market because he felt unethical. Um, there was rumors that a brother killed uh, his brother uh, just because he got a higher score than he did. And the next day, the developer of the game decided to pull the game out. Okay, and at the at the day he pulled the game out, uh, he was making fifty thousand dollars as a revenue per day. Okay, so fifty thousand dollars per day from a game that, if any of you is a gaming enthusiast, would take thirty to forty-five minutes to to develop. Okay. Uh, the examples are, are a lot. So indie games like Tiny Wings, for example, with 10 million uh, copies sold, a very small game, and yet uh, it's not a small game, but again, an indie game, interesting one, just a good idea, and he got there. Okay, So th that's the first thing. So if you want to start, you don't need to look for publishers. You can start by, your, by yourself. Uh, my second point, and this is really important, if you want to start your own company, never ignore the part that is uh, games for marketing. Okay? There are huge companies in Egypt, there are huge companies in the region okay, uh, that need marketing. And the best way to do marketing is through games. It appeals to everyone. But if you want to go that way, just take care. Because marketing agencies are not gamers. Okay, so there would be a lot of clashes between you and the, and the agencies. And at the end of the day, you have to respect their opinion because simply they know their market. Their market is not gamers. Their market is everyone at large. Okay? And the last point I want to talk about is marketing for games. Okay? So yes, games like uh, Flappy Bird was a huge success uh, without marketing, without spending a penny, but that would happen one in a billion. Okay, If you want to have a game, if you want to have a huge success, you have to spend, and you have to spend a lot. Budgets of up to $40,000 uh, and even more are expected in, in mobile apps uh, market. So uh, you have to consider marketing a lot, you have to make a budget for it, and then you have to have crazy ideas about the marketing. So, so anyways, uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, there is the fan page of the Archipels. Uh, I'd appreciate if you'd go check it out. If you like it, then please uh, like it out there. And the presentation itself that I presented today is available if anyone would send me an uh, email. I'll send it back to him. Uh, my email is Rami Wasif at Streaming Creative English. Thank you. Thank you, Romy, for um, this insight, not only global trends of gaming, but also the really personal insight in your learnings, but also how you approach this field and every game you created. Thanks for this insight. And also, um, because there's a saying over there, you can see it, everyone, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And it seems like you started with 10 and you're still doing it to create stuff. Yeah, that was a prediction. I had a very long time. Prediction. Yeah, keep it up. And I hope you inspired some people in the audience as well to start creating it. And I guess sure. you're going to be around for questions. If there's, is there a question in the audience? Right. Oh, that was a straight hand. <laughs> okay, you're going to get the chance. So we're going to pick one question out of the audience. All the other ones can ask the questions later. So please, what is the question? I'm going to So uh, my question is, as long as you worked uh, before with uh, different NGOs and foundations and develop for de supporting developing games, uh, why we didn't see before a game that 
saves lives more than it destroys cities or armies or whatever. Like, I think that would be really interesting if you have a game that maybe you go to somewhere where there is a starvation or places with devastated, uh, maybe environmental issues or something, and you're trying to collaborate, maybe to dig wells, to uh, offer food for the people, to make them uh, not to die, you know, trying to save people that are starving or whatever, to to stay alive as much as you can. And you're just like, I, I think that would be really interesting. And maybe also from the ethical part, it will be interesting for kids and to think in this positive way rather than to have this destruction. Because, you know, lots of people are blaming the gaming industry that part of the blames that I get re rather than the, uh, the like, the... Uh, uh, whatever the sexual things and uh, the, the, the this kind of uh, uh, violence and all all these things, I think that will be really interesting to have in the in the gaming industry. <laughs> okay, that was I think a question and an answer, but no, I think but it, okay, I think we're gonna get an input. So thank you for the question and thanks for answering. I think that's a question a few people had in their minds when you were talking about it. So what do you think? What would you like to add to this question? Okay, I. My, my first answer would be Cerberus. So the game we've developed is a game saving lives. Most of the projects we've worked on, like the Yazidi crisis or uh, Philippines, or actually the, currently the project is targeting uh, the rainforests in Ghana. We're trying to save them. We're trying to help the farmers yield more crops without damaging the forest. So uh, there are games. Actually, th there's a game on, on uh, mobile phones uh, as far as I remember, it's called Cure, uh, Play for Cure. And this game is helping researchers in, uh, in the UK uh, try to battle cancer. So you play the game, and actually while doing so, you're trying to unlock the genes. You try to unlock the mystery of genes, uh, so genetic engineering and so on. While you're not doing anything, you're just playing a very simple game, but actually it's really helping them. And so games are being directed this way, but the, the thing is, it's not that much fun. When you go kill someone or have an explosion or so on, that's interesting, but just playing a game like Cerberus, Cerberus is a little fun that you, you go explore, you find a lot of things, but not everybody is fond of exploration, everybody is fond of explosions, actually. So actually you're challenging the crowd that they should create games which are fun, and um, because they're not in the market until now, or not that many, to feel, fulfill the need, um, he was the question he was giving you. Yes, uh, I'd say that's a challenge we, we should target, and the market is huge for that. Lots of people care, and I guess there's a market for it. Okay, there's a hack mania actually in the fourth floor, so maybe you should head up there. And no, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for the question, thanks for answering. And yeah, thanks again for giving us a glimpse into the gaming. Um, way of like the global trends in this sector. At 10.30 for everyone, we're gonna have Internet of Things, so we're gonna have a glimpse into the global trends in this area as well, so please be back at 10.30. You can have a quick break or stay here. If not, um, enjoy the break. And yeah, thanks again, Romy, and see you at 10.30 with the Internet of Things. <laughs>